Hi, I'm Dave Merrill. During my career, I've reviewed many courses in all content areas. Much of this instruction is far less effective and engaging than it could be. What's missing? Too often, there are insufficient or inappropriate examples. And even more often, there is insufficient or inappropriate opportunity for application of the skills that learners are supposed to be acquiring. In this brief lecture, I will try to address this deficiency in much of our instruction and propose a possible way to enhance its effectiveness, efficiency, and engagement. For over 50 years, my career has been focused on one very important question. What makes instruction effective, efficient, and engaging? I decided that e-learning should refer to the quality of instruction, not merely to how it is delivered. So I labeled effective, efficient, and engaging as e to the third power instruction. In this brief presentation, I will try to share with you a little of what I've learned. Perhaps the underlying message of my studies and this presentation is this simple statement. Information alone is not instruction. All of us have heard the saying that students didn't learn because they just weren't motivated or that motivation is the most important part of learning or we really need to find a way to motivate our students. So what is it that causes motivation? People have often asked me, is motivation one of the five principles I mentioned? And the answer is no. Motivation is not something we can do. Motivation is an outcome. So if it's an outcome, what causes motivation? Motivation comes from learning. The greatest motivation comes when people learn. We are wired to learn. All of us love to learn. Every student loves to learn. And generally, we are motivated by those things we find that we're good at. For example, I am not much of an athlete. I look back on my past and say, why am I not an athlete? And I remember that I was very small as a child. And in my elementary school, we used to divide up into teams over recess. And I always ended up as last shag on the girls team. And that was very embarrassing for me, and consequently I lost interest in sports. I felt like I did not want to be a sports person, and consequently I never pursued sports. On the other hand, somewhere in my childhood, I was given a very uh, interesting scale model train. I found that I was very interested in trains, as all little boys are. But in this case, one of my friends, my father's friends, showed me how to build scenery and how to make a model railroad that looked like the real world. I became very interested in that and consequently throughout my life I pursued the hobby of model railroading. Why? Why was I motivated to do this? Because I was good at it. I learned things about it and the more I learned the more interested I got. We need to find ways to motivate our students and that comes from promoting learning and learning comes when we apply the effective principles of learning and the principles of instruction. In my experience, I've had the opportunity to review many courses. This animation illustrates a common instructional sequence that I've observed. You may also have observed this common instructional sequence and may have used a variation of this sequence in your own courses. The course or module consists of a list of topics representing the content of the course. Information about the topic is presented represented by the arrows. Occasionally a quiz or exercise is inserted to help illustrate the topic represented by the boxes. The sequence is to teach one topic at a time. At the end of the course or module, there is often a culminating final test or in some cases a final project that asks the students to apply the topic or the topics to complete some task or to solve some problem. Sometimes this sequence is very effective in enabling students to gain skills or to learn to solve problems. Too often, however, this sequence is ineffective or not engaging for students. The effectiveness of this sequence and the degree of engagement it promotes 
depends on the type of learning events that are represented by the arrows and boxes in this diagram. There are many different types of instructional or learning events. Perhaps the most frequently used learning event is to present information or tell. This tell can take many forms including lectures, videos, textbooks, PowerPoint, etc. The next most frequent instructional or learning event is to have learners remember what they were told or what they read or what they saw. This remember instructional event we will label as ask. Even though tell and ask are the most frequently used instructional events, if they are the only instructional events, then the tell ask instructional sequence is the least effective instructional strategy. Uh, this diagram illustrates the typical instructional sequence we illustrated earlier, but in this diagram we've labeled information arrows with the learning event tell and practice or test learning events ask. If the remaining topics are also taught with the same tell ask sequence of learning, then this module is not going to be very effective and most likely will not prepare learners to adequately complete a project using the information taught. In our diagram, we've included a final exam rather than a final project. They may be able to score on, well on a ASK final exam, but this does little to prepare them to apply the ideas taught to the solution of a complex problem or completion of a complex task. Unfortunately, this tell ask type of instructional sequence is very common. I'm currently working with the faculty composed of international professors from a number of different countries. Their instructional methods vary, but by far the most common instructional strategy is the one we've illustrated with tell and ask instructional events. Here's an example typical of many of the approaches originally used by this faculty. With the permission of the faculty member, I am sharing a slide from the PowerPoint presentation originally used in this course in business ethics along with the corresponding examination question from the final exam. This is obviously only a small part of this course on business ethics, but it is a critical learning event because if the learner does not learn to distinguish an ethical issue from an ethical dilemma, then it is unlikely they will be able to learn to help businesses solve ethical problems. The professor of this course did have an assignment for each small group of students to review the business practices of an assigned business to see if they could identify ethical dilemmas or ethical issues. They reported their findings to the class. Such a find examples assignment is better than no examples, but naive learners are not likely to identify the best examples or even to be able to observe an example when it does occur. In 1999, Charles Rigeluth published a collection of papers on instructional design theories and models. In the preface to this book, he indicates that there are many different kinds of instructional theories and that instructional designers need to be familiar with these different approaches and select the best approach or a combination of approaches that they felt were appropriate for their particular instructional situation. I challenged Dr. Rigeluth, suggesting that while these different theories stress different aspects of instruction and use different vocabulary to describe their models and methods, that fundamentally, at a deep level, they were all based on a common set of principles. Dr. Rigeluth kindly suggested that, that he didn't think that my assumption was correct. But if I felt strongly about it, perhaps I should try to find evidence for my assumption. I took the challenge and spent the next year or two studying these various instructional theories. The result was a publication in 2002 of my often referenced paper on first principles of instruction. I've spent the time since in refining my proposition in a series of papers and chapters on first principles. In 2013 I finally published my book, First Principles of Instruction, that elaborated these principles provided a set of suggestions for how these principles might be implemented in various models of instruction, and providing a wide variety of instructional samples that illustrate the implementation of first principles in a wide range of content areas and at different levels of education, including training, public schools, and higher education. 
Principles are statements of relationship that are true under appropriate conditions. In instruction, these relationships are between different kinds of learning events and the effect that participating in these learning events has on the acquisition of problem-solving skills. I identified five general principles that comprise first principles of instruction. As I reviewed the literature on instructional design theories and models, I tried to be as parsimonious as possible by selecting only a few general principles that would account for most learning activities that are necessary for effective, efficient, and engaging instruction. A frequently cited axiom of education is to start where the learner is. Activation is the principle that attempts to activate a relevant mental model already acquired by the learner to assist he or she to adapt this mental model to the new skills that are to be acquired. I carefully avoided the word presentation for this principle. Much instruction consists largely or entirely of presentation. What is often missing is demonstration or show me. Hence, the demonstration principle is best implemented by tell-show learning events where appropriate information is accompanied by appropriate examples. Way too much instruction uses remembering information as a primary assessment tool. But remembering information is insufficient for being able to identify newly encountered instances of some object or event. Remembering is also insufficient to be able to execute a set of steps in a procedure or to grasp the events of a process. Learners need to apply their newly acquired skills to actually doing a task or actually solving a problem. Deep learning requires learners to integrate their newly acquired skills to those mental models they have already acquired. One way to ensure this deep processing is for learners to collaborate with other learners in solving problems or doing complex tasks. Another learning event that facilitates deep processing is when the learners go public with their knowledge in an effort to critique other learners or defend their work when it is criticized by other learners. The eventual purpose of all instruction is to learn to solve complex problems or complete complex tasks either by themselves or in collaboration with other learners. This is accomplished best when problem to be solved or the task to be completed is identified and demonstrated to learners early in the instructional sequence. Subsequent component skills required for the problem solving or for completing a complex task are best acquired in the context of trying to solve a real instance of the problem or complete a real instance of the task. In this presentation, I will elaborate and illustrate three of these principles, the demonstration, application, and problem-centered principles. Do first principles of instruction actually promote more effective, efficient, and engaging instruction? I would like to report on a couple of research studies that demonstrate the effectiveness of first principles. A study conducted by NetG, a company that sells instruction to teach computer applications, compared their off-the-shelf version of their Excel instruction, which is topic-centered, with a problem-centered version of this course that was developed following first principles. Participants in this experiment came from a number of different companies that were clients of NetG. The assessment for both groups consisted of developing a spreadsheet for three real-world Excel problems. The problem center group scored significantly higher, required significantly less time to complete the problems, and expressed a higher level of satisfaction than the topic centered group. All these differences are statistically significant beyond the .001 level. A doctoral student at Florida State University completed a dissertation study comparing a topic centered course teaching flash programming with a problem-centered course. This study was carefully controlled so that the variables were merely the arrangement of the skill instruction in the context of problems or taught skill by skill. The learning events for both groups were identical except for the order and the context in which they were taught. On a transfer flash problem, 
that required students to apply their flash programming skills to a new problem, the problem center group scored significantly higher than the topic center group and felt the instruction was more relevant and resulted in more confidence in their performance. There was no time difference between the two groups for completing the project. A professor at Indiana University designed a student evaluation questionnaire that had students indicate whether the course being evaluated included first principles of instruction. The correlations all show that the extent to which first principles are included in a course correlates with student rating of instructor quality and their rating of satisfaction with the course. Students also spent more time on task and were judged by their instructors to have more learning, make more learning progress when the courses involved first principles of instruction. This data was collected in three different studies. The data reported here included 490 students in 12 different courses. The conclusion that can be drawn from these three different and independent studies of first principles clearly show that courses based on first principles do facilitate effectiveness, efficiency, and learner satisfaction. When I'm asked to review course material, my approach is to immediately turn to Module 3 of the material. By then, the course is usually into the heart of the content and the introductory material is finished. So what do I look for? I look for examples. Does the content include examples, demonstrations, or simulations of the ideas being taught? Adding demonstration to a course that doesn't have them will result in a significant increment in the effectiveness of that course. Well, don't most in courses already include such demonstration? MOOCs are a recent very popular way to deliver instruction. How well do these massive open online courses implement first principles of instruction? Anash Margarian and her colleagues published an important paper titled Instructional Quality of Massive Online Courses MOOCs, that addresses this question. They carefully analyzed 76 MOOCs representing a wide variety of content sponsored by a number of different institutions to determine the extent that these courses implemented first principles of instruction. Their overall conclusion? Most of these courses failed to implement these principles. The demonstration principle, providing examples of the content being taught, is fundamental for effective instruction and engaging instruction. How many of these MOOCs implemented this principle? Their data show that only three of the 76 MOOCs included appropriate demonstration. The effectiveness and engagement in these MOOCs could be significantly increased by adding relevant and appropriate demonstration. When I'm asked to review a course, the second type of learning event I look for is the application that is consistent with and appropriate for the type of learning involved. Remembering a definition or remembering a series of steps is not application. There are two types of application that are most important but too often not included. Do ID or do identify requires learners to recognize new divergent examples of an object or event when they encounter it. Do identify is also the initial application required when learning the steps of a procedure or process. The learner must first recognize a correctly executed step when they see it, and they must also recognize the consequence that resulted from the execution of the step. Once they can recognize appropriate steps and appropriate consequences for these steps, then do execute is the next level of application. Do execute requires learners to actually perform or execute the steps of a procedure. When appropriate application is missing, the effectiveness of the course is significantly increased when the appropriate application learning events are added. MOOCs are often about teaching learners new skills. Did the MOOCs in the study include appropriate application for these skills? They fared better than they did for demonstration. At least 46 of the 76 MOOCs did include some form of application. This still leaves 30 MOOCs in this study 
without application of any kind. However, on careful analysis of the sufficiency and appropriateness of the application included, it was found that only 13 of the MOOCs in this study had appropriate and sufficient application. While tell and ask are the most frequently used instructional events, as we have seen, a strategy that used only these two learning events is not an effective or engaging strategy. Learning to solve problems and to do complex tasks is facilitated when a tell instructional strategy is enhanced by adding demonstration or show learning events. A tell show sequence is more effective than a tell only sequence. Learning to solve problems and to do complex tasks is facilitated even more when a tell show strategy is further enhanced by adding do instructional events. These do learning events are most appropriate when they require learners to identify unencountered instances of some object or event, that is, a do identify learning events, and when they require learners to execute the steps in a procedure or observe the steps in a process, do execute learning events. A tell show do sequence is even more effective than a tell show instructional sequence. Most existing instruction can be considerably enhanced by the addition of appropriate show and do learning events. Here is our typical instructional sequence once again, but this time we've indicated that the presentation consists of tell and show learning events with do learning events inserted at appropriate intervals. The final project is not merely a remember or ask assessment but the opportunity for learners to apply the skills they have acquired from the tell show do instruction to a more complete problem or task. When a typical instructional sequence consists of tell show do learning events, the resulting learning will be more effective, efficient, and engaging for learners. Much existing instruction can be significantly enhanced by converting from tell ask learning events in this typical instructional sequence to tell show do learning events. Here is the business ethical dilemma module which was originally a tell ask instructional sequence. We started with one of the slides from the original PowerPoint presentation that defines an ethical dilemma contrasted with an ethical issue. To enhance this module we searched the internet for examples of ethical dilemmas and ethical issues we were surprised with the number and variety of examples that are available both in text format and video format. This short video is an example of an ethical issue in a public school setting. This first example provides both an ethical issue, an inappropriate act by a female teacher, and an ethical dilemma for the male teacher telling the story. As third year teacher at Littletown Middle School, Terry Sanders brings an infectious energy to her classroom. Both faculty and students like Terry and find it easy to get caught up in her enthusiasm. And like many young professionals her age, Terry is active in social media. A lot of us here are new teachers. I think Terry's in her third year or so. And most of us are still in our 20s, so we all follow each other on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram. And it was never a problem until about a week ago. Her tweet said, just saw a cop in the school parking lot with the dog. Hope they don't go near my car. Hashtag, just saying hi. Scott became more concerned about Terry when one of her posts over the weekend seemed to cross the line. It was Monday morning, and I had some time before my first class started. And so I'm looking up what people did over the weekend, and I find this photo of Terry on Instagram. It looked like she was at some kind of party. She has teachers and students who follow her. You know, I have no idea who's seen this by now or what, if anything, I should do about it. Here is a second example that is an ethical dilemma also in a school setting. Ron Clark has been teaching science at Franklin Middle School for more than four years. Recently, he noticed one of his students, Teresa Miller, has been arriving later and later to first period class. 
Today, she showed up a full 30 minutes after the class started. I'm sorry, Mr. Clark. I know I'm late again. Teresa, this is turning into a real problem. There's nothing I can do about it. My mom got another job, and she doesn't get home from work until after 8. That's all right. Uh, look, I'll talk to your mom, and we'll figure something out. I could tell Teresa was upset. She lives outside the district, so we don't provide bus transportation for her to get to school. I called Teresa's mom several times, never got a hold of her. I left her a message to please get in contact with me at her earliest convenience to talk about her daughter's late arrivals. I brought this signed note excusing Teresa for being late to class. Every morning, this should take care of everything. No, this note doesn't help Teresa. She's still missing half my class. Look, I had to take a second job. I'm a single mom with two girls. I'm a cook at the retirement center down on Oak Street. Yeah, I know where that is. It's actually not far from where I live. It's right by my house, but sometimes breakfast runs late. Look, I know you need to work. Look, do you have a, a friend or a relative who can drop your daughter off? No, it's just me. Look, maybe since you live right near there, I could take her into work with me, and you could bring her into school with you. That would solve everything, right? The instructor would elaborate each of these examples, pointing out the nature of the dilemma involved and why the case was an ethical issue rather than an ethical dilemma. The revised module included several additional examples of both ethical dilemmas and ethical issues in a variety of different settings, each accompanied by elaboration of the nature of the dilemma or issue involved. Finally, the revised model included additional examples that were presented to learners to ask them to identify them either as an ethical issue or an ethical dilemma. They were also asked to explain the nature of the dilemma or issue involved in each of these examples. This tell, show, do module has not yet been delivered to students, so there's not data on its effectiveness, efficiency, and engagement compared with the original module. But even face validity would indicate that it's much more likely to be engaging than the original tell, ask instruction. To summarize, much existing instruction is primarily tell-ask instruction. This instruction can be significantly enhanced by the demonstration of appropriate examples or show learning events, and even further enhanced by the addition of appropriate application activities or do learning events. The fundamental instructional design procedure to enhance existing instruction is fairly straightforward. Start by identifying the topics that are taught in a given module. List these topics, see the left column of the matrix. Across the top of the matrix, list the four primary learning event types, tell, ask, show, and do. Second, review the information in the tell column to ensure that each topic is accurate and sufficient for the goals of the instruction. Third, identify existing show learning events for each topic. If the existing instruction does not include appropriate or sufficient examples of each of the concepts, principles, procedures, or processes listed, identify or create appropriate examples for inclusion in the module. You may want to use this matrix as a cross-reference for the new content examples you identify or create. Fourth, identify existing do learning events for each topic. If the existing instruction does not include appropriate or sufficient do learning events, then identify or create appropriate do identify or do execute learning events for inclusion in the module. Finally, assemble the new demonstrations and applications into your module for more effective, efficient, and engaging instruction. Even after appropriate demonstration and application learning events are added to this traditional instructional sequence, there is still a potential problem that keeps this instructional sequence from being as effective, efficient, and engaging as possible. In this sequence, topics are taught one by one. The demonstration and application learning events added to a tell sequence are usually examples that apply to only a single component skill and are merely a small part of solving a whole problem. 
Too often, learners fail to see the relevance of some of these individual skills when they are learned out of context. We have all experienced the often used explanation, you won't understand this now, but later it will be very important to you. If later in this situation is several days or weeks, there's a good possibility that the learner will have forgotten the component skill before they get to actually use this skill in solving a whole problem or doing a whole task. Or if learners do not see the relevance of a particular skill, they may have failed to actually learn the skill, or they are unable to identify a mental model into which they can incorporate this skill. Then when it's time to use the skill in the solution of a whole problem, learners are unable to retrieve the skill because it was merely memorized rather than understood. Furthermore, if solving a whole problem or doing a whole task is the final project for a module or course, there may be no opportunity to get feedback and revise the project. Is there a better sequence? One that is more effective, efficient and engaging than this typical sequence? To maximize engagement in learning a new problem solving skill, learners need to acquire these skills in the context of the problem they are learning to solve or the task they are learning to complete. If learners first activate a relevant mental model, that is the activation principle, and then are shown an example of the problem they are, will learn to solve and how to solve this problem, then they are more likely to see the relevance of each individual skill when it is taught and they will have a framework into which they can incorporate this new skill, greatly increasing the probability of efficient retrieval and application when they are confronted with a new instance of the problem. Does existing instruction use a problem-centered sequence in instruction? Even though many of the MOOCs are designed to facilitate problem solving, Margarian and her colleagues found that only eight of the 76 MOOCs they analyzed were problem-centered. Several previous surveys of existing instruction in various contexts have found that most courses do not use a problem-centered instructional sequence or even involve students in the solution of real-world problems as a final project. A typical instructional sequence is topic-centered, that is, each topic is taught one by one and then at the end of the module or course, learners are expected to apply each of these topics to the solution of a final problem or the completion of a final task. A problem-centered sequence turns this sequence around. Rather than telling an objective for the module, which is a form of information, the first learning activity is to show a whole instance of the problem that learners are being taught to solve. This demonstration also overviews the solution to the problem or the execution of the task. Students are then told about the component skills necessary to the solution of this instance of the problem and how each of these component skills contributed to the solution of the problem is then shown to the student. After this tell-show demonstration for the first instance of a problem is complete, a second problem instance is identified and shown to learners. The learner is then required to apply the previously acquired component skills to the second problem. Some of the component skills may require some additional information or a different way of using the skill to solve the second instance of the problem. Learners are then told this new information and shown its application in the second instance of the problem. Note that the tell, show, do for each component skill or topic is now distributed across different instances of the problem. The first instance of the problem was primarily tell, show. The second instance of the problem is a combination of tell, show for new parts of each component skill and do for those component skills already acquired. Additional instances of the problem are identified. Learners apply those skills already acquired, that is tell, show, and apply those skills already acquired, do, for each new instance of the problem. The sequence is complete when learners are required to solve a new instance of the problem without additional guidance. This problem-centered instructional sequence makes it more likely that learners will see the relevance of each new component skill, will provide multiple opportunities for learners to apply each of these newly acquired component skills in the context of real instances of the problem. This problem-centered sequence enables learners to see the relationship among the individual component skills in the context of each new instance of the problem. 
This problem-centered sequence also provides gradually diminishing guidance to learners until they're able to solve a new instance of the problem without this guidance. Instruction that is revised to include a tell-show-do sequence of learning events, all in the context of solving a progression of instances of a whole problem or a whole task, has the potential of being maximally engaging for students while providing efficient and effective learning activities. An entrepreneur course designed and developed at BYU-Hawaii illustrates a problem-centered instructional sequence. This course was designed to introduce students from developing countries with the course in entrepreneurship. The slogan of the business department for these students from the third world is don't go home and be an employee, but go home and be an employer. Six major component skills were identified as being necessary to the establishment and running of a small business. <laughs> these skills are listed in the left side of the slide. Each of these skills also has nested within it a number of sub-skills for each of these main skills. This course is taught with a sequence of five examples of small businesses that were developed for developing countries. The type of each business is listed in the tabs across the top of the slide. The product business was a pig farm in Cambodia. The service business was a carpet cleaning business in Mongolia. The retail business was a cell phone franchise in Laie, Hawaii. The restaurant business was a Mexican restaurant in Russia. After studying each of these four businesses, students were required to develop a business plan for their own small business designed for their own country. This whole course is available without cost on the internet. Contact me at professordavemerrill at gmail.com and I will send you a link to this course. Note that the course involves a progression of examples of developing whole small businesses. Each of these businesses involve the same set of skills. Each business is more complex than the preceding business and while using the same skills requires more detail for each of these skills. Remember, the first task in a problem-centered sequence is to present an example of the whole problem. In the entrepreneur course, this was Viesna's pig farm. Here's a very brief excerpt from the introduction to this business. The actual introduction video ran for about 15 minutes and overviewed all the steps taken by Viesna to design and start his business. Viesna Nang, a graduate of Brigham Young University, Hawaii, returned to his native homeland of Cambodia, where he wanted to start his own business. Cambodia is a poverty-stricken third world country in Southeast Asia. Many people in Cambodia live in extreme conditions of poverty. The economy is slow and mostly based on agriculture. One day, Vezna's brother tells him that two things are needed in Cambodia, construction and pigs. After careful analysis and research, Vezna decided to start a pig farm. The second step in a problem-centered sequence is to present the skills required for completing this task. This demonstration shows only the first component skill. Note that it introduces the skill and then illustrates the skill for this particular business. In the course, each detail for each of the component skills was introduced and illustrated for Viesna's pig farm. The presentation of this first example uses tell-show learning events. This tell-show demonstration for the first business requires a couple of hours to complete. Note, each skill is illustrated and its application to this business is demonstrated. In a business-centered sequence, the problem is shown first and then all of the skills to be taught are introduced in the context of this example. There are two characteristics of a good business opportunity. First, there must be enough people with an unsatisfied need or want. And second, it must have the potential to make a profit. Here is a beginning checklist for how to recognize a complete business opportunity statement. Is there an unsatisfied need or want? Are there enough people with this unsatisfied need or want? Are there enough of these people with this unsatisfied need or want who are willing to pay for a solution and pay enough so that the business can make a profit? Are the people who are willing to pay for a product or service able to pay? Entrepreneurs are not wild risk takers. In fact, 
They do all they can to reduce as many risks as possible. That is why you need to make sure that your opportunity is a real opportunity. With each item, what is the evidence that this is a potentially successful business opportunity? Where did the information come from? How do we know it is true or accurate? Here is a statement of business opportunity. Click on each paragraph to see how each part of the statement relates to the business opportunity checklist. In a problem-centered sequence, the next step is to introduce a second instance of the problem, in this case, Sigi's and Soto's carpet cleaning business. Like the pig farm, this example is also introduced with an introductory video that overviews this carpet cleaning business and the steps necessary to start it. With a new instance of the problem, the learner is required to apply those elements of the skill that were introduced in the last business to this new business. Then additional details of each of the skills are introduced and their use illustrated for this second business. In this example we show only the first skill and how learners are asked to engage in do identify for those skills that were previously illustrated. For purposes of this lecture I've shown application for only part of the first skill. As before, each of the skills are applied to this new example including both do ID and then more tell show. All of the do, tell, and show learning events for the component skills for this new business again require several hours of instruction. Again, note that the sequence is to teach the component skills within the context of a problem rather than to teach all of each skill in the abstract and only after teaching all of the skills to have learners apply them to a new problem. In summary, you may want to analyze your courses. Perhaps their effectiveness, efficiency, and especially their engagement might be enhanced by adding appropriate demonstration, application, and using a problem-centered instructional sequence. Do they include appropriate and adequate demonstration? Do they include appropriate and adequate application? Are the skills taught in the context of an increasingly complex progression of instances of the problem? Thank you for your participation in this lecture on first principles of instruction. It's been my pleasure to prepare this lecture for you. I welcome your comments and questions. Please don't hesitate to contact me as you study first principles of instruction and as you try to improve the quality, efficiency, and engagement of your instruction. First principles of instruction is currently available in English and Korean and a Chinese translation is underway and should be available in the near future. Thank you.